work now. Okay, let's see. Get this off my screen here. All righty. So good evening, everyone, and thank you for attending Building Your Toolbox, a monthly educational series where practitioners teach individuals a pain management strategy or skill. Tonight, we are joined by guest presenter, Dr. Jason Winkleman, who will be discussing mitochondrial health and its impact on chronic pain. My name is Michelle Rice and I live with chronic pain and I've had uh, complex regional pain syndrome for the last 23 years. And I serve as the patient engagement lead for US Pain Foundation. Joining me tonight is Bobby Blades, a longtime volunteer support group leader for the organization. Uh, next slide here. The U.S. Pain Foundation is committed to improving the lives of people with pain. Our mission is to empower, educate, connect, and advocate for all individuals, kids, and adults living with chronic illness or serious injuries that cause pain, as well as their caregivers and clinicians. Recognizing that nearly every chronic condition has a pain component, our network is extensive. We work to elevate the patient voice increase disease state education, improve pain care through policy change, expand outreach to underserved and marginalized communities, and provide comprehensive resources to ensure individuals are supported and empowered along their journeys. The organization develops free programs and services to help individuals. Our programs include a national network of support groups, educational resources and events, a pediatric program for children and families, advocacy efforts, an awareness magazine called The Invisible Project, and so much more. To learn more or how to get involved, please visit us at uspainfoundation.org. Okay. Here is our agenda for this evening. After reviewing a few housekeeping items, we will introduce our guest presenter, Dr. Winkleman. Tonight's topic will focus on mitochondrial health. Some of the things we will learn include what are, my, what are your mitochondria? Why mitochondria? Ah, tongue twister. What are your mitochondria? Why mitochondrial health is so important for healing chronic pain? Why mitochondrial health is so overlooked? What is damaging your mitochondria? How to improve mitochondrial health through simple nutritional and lifestyle modifications. Following the discussion, we will open it up for Q&A. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Bobby to share more about the logistics for tonight. So all participants are on mute for the first portion. Questions will be taken at the very end. During the Q&A, please raise your hand through the icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen. In many cases, it's the reactions button. It looks like a smiley face. Hover over that with your uh, mouse and it'll say raise hand. And then when you're done talking, you can lower your hand. Keep questions on topic as much as possible. If responding to another participant, be careful not to rescue or give advice. We're here to validate and support each other. Remember, different treatments work differently for everyone. Please be respectful of other opinions. Please remute yourself once done speaking. Next slide. Disclaimer, at tonight's event, oops, could you go back please once? There we go. Tonight's event is educational only. The information is not meant to take the place of your healthcare provider. You should always consult with your practitioner about your unique health situation. The US Pain Foundation does not recommend or endorse any one therapy, treatment, or product. If you feel tonight that your medical condition conditions are adversely affected by your participation, in this webinar. It's your responsibility to discontinue participation and to immediately consult with your healthcare provider. Thank you. Thank you, Bobby. 
So I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our guest speaker for tonight, Dr. Jason Winkleman. Dr. Jason Winkleman is a naturopathic doctor and a chiropractor in the Denver metropolitan area. Treating chronic pain has become Dr. Winkleman's purpose and mission. He works with all patient demographics and types of chronic pain. No matter how long someone has been living with pain or how severe. He specializes in treating chronic pain naturally without the use of medications, injections, or procedures. You can find him at his clinic, True Health Natural Pain Center in Northern Denver. Dr. Winkleman, we are so excited to have you speak tonight. Thank you for being here. Oh, thank you guys for having me back. Okay, right. Let's find my presentation. All right, can we all see? Yes, thank you. Wonderful, all right. Thank you all for having me back. I really enjoyed doing this last time. Um, so I hope you have your notebooks because we're gonna learn. Mm -hmm. um, but before I get started, like I tell everyone, chronic pain is a physical, a biochemical and a mental emotional process. It doesn't matter how you got into pain, you now have all three of these components working against you. And if you want to get out of chronic pain, you have to address all three of these things. Something that modern medicine doesn't really do a good job at, especially all at the same time. But I do want to remind you that there are answers for your pain. It doesn't matter how much that you've tried, there's still more out there. And I think that you're recognizing that by coming to these uh, toolbox talks. But at the same time, there's no one thing that is going to work to get you out of chronic pain. This is a cumulative effort by a lot of different things. That's just how the human body works. And that's how what it takes to get out of chronic pain. Um, and if you're familiar with my chronic pain program, you know that it is completely individualized because that's the only way to get out of pain. I always say you have to treat the person, not the condition. Um, but there's two exceptions to that. One, we're going to fight inflammation through your gut health, which was the topic of my last uh, toolbox talk. And we're going to make sure that your mitochondria are in tip top shape. After those two things, then everything is completely individualized. Um, but then also viewer discretion is advised. There's potentially boring information ahead. I certainly don't think so. I think this is all fascinating. I hope you do too. But we're going to get a little nitty gritty here deep into the science just so you understand what's going on, because I firmly believe that in order for you to make any changes, you need to know why you are making those changes. So first off, we have the cell. It's our most basic unit of life, and it is composed of organelles. And your organelles are essentially the organs of your body. Just like we have a heart that has a different function than our liver, has a different function than our kidneys, all of these organelles have very specific tasks. And because the cell is so complex, it is very energy consuming. But where do we get that energy from? The mitochondria. Now, if you remember from middle school, high school, even college biology class, we always said the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. And unfortunately, that's where that topic started and ended, which was a shame because this is such an important organelle that um, is so vital for life and for healing. Now, we have hundreds to thousands of mitochondria per cell, and it depends on the cell type of how many mitochondria it needs, basically how much energy does that cell need. The mitochondria are involved in a process called cellular respiration. This is the process of taking the food that we eat plus the oxygen that we breathe to create ATP, the energy that we use. It's our main fuel source. It's the gas to our cars. It's the electricity to our phones. Your mitochondria produce so much energy that in fact, they are likely the most energy producing things in the universe. They actually produce 10,000 times more energy per gram than the sun. So that should really sink in for you and let you know that we really need to take care of our mitochondria because us humans, we need a lot of energy just to get through the day. Uh, by weight, we're 10% mitochondria. Again, that's a lot of mitochondria. 
Um, but like all good things, mitochondria decline with age. So just to help get the ball rolling a little bit, uh, there are some common conditions associated with mitochondrial dysfunction that you've probably never even like heard of before. You never heard that they were associated with mitochondria. Things like cardiovascular diseases, angina, high blood pressure, congestive heart failure, strokes, neurodegenerative disorders like dementia, Alzheimer's, even Parkinson's disease, and things like depression, ADD, ADHD, type 2 diabetes, aging skin and wrinkles. Do I have some of your attention now? Infertility, macular degeneration, glaucoma, and yes, even cancer. 95% of cancers are metabolic, meaning that they have a degree of mitochondrial dysfunction. So how do mitochondria produce energy? Well, the first step is glycolysis, essentially glucose from sugar and carbs that we eat enters your cell and then goes through all these different transformations, this whole glycolysis pathway to eventually become pyruvate. Pyruvate is then able to enter the mitochondria where it gets converted into acetyl-CoA and then goes through this TCA cycle, the tricyclic acid, also known as citric acid cycle or Krebs cycle. It's a big complex pathway. And the funny thing about it is the only purpose of this pathway, or at least the main purpose, is to create these byproducts, NADH here, here, and here. Because NADH is what goes on to the next step, the electron transport chain. So now we are deep into the mitochondria. NADH drops off an electron here. So anyways, the electron transport chain is composed of one, two, three, four different complexes. So the NADH from that last step drops off an electron. And then FADH2 from a different pathway drops off an electron into complex two. Both of those electrons get picked up by CoQ10, which you may have heard of. It's a popular supplement now. CoQ10 shuttles the electrons through complex three, through cytochrome C, and through complex four, where that electron is met with an oxygen molecule. Oxygen plus this extra electron creates water. You may have never thought about it before, but this is the reason why we breathe, is to supply your mitochondria with oxygen because oxygen is that final electron acceptor in the electron transport chain. Without oxygen, this whole thing shuts down and we can't make energy. So while the electrons are being transported through all these complexes, Complex one, three, and four are pumping out hydrogen protons. These protons accumulate in this inner membrane space and then get pumped through this enzyme called ATP synthase. And this is where ATP, your energy, your gas, your electricity is created. ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. And I show you this diagram um, because I want you to remember ribose. So adenine, a ribose, and three phosphate groups make up ATP. But this five carbon sugar is the backbone. It's the building block to make ATP. And I know I said this whole process started with glucose, but glucose sugar is actually a really inefficient way to make energy. One molecule of glucose only makes 38 molecules of ATP. Whereas fatty acids actually create 129 ATP. That's more than three times as much. Fatty acids are responsible for 60 to 70% of your total energy production. And it starts with this process called beta oxidation. So kind of like glycolysis, we start with a long chain fatty acid and it gets converted down into acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA is then able to enter the Krebs cycle citric acid cycle, TCA cycle. But before it does that, it creates that FADH2 and that NADH. So now it gets shuttled into the Krebs cycle where it makes more NADH and then goes to the electron transport chain. So now this is why fat is so efficient is because it's creating all of this on its own and in much greater quantities. So why is mitochondrial dysfunction so bad? Well, you're probably picking up on the obvious right now. We need ATP 
energy to do anything and everything. Without it, we simply cannot exist. We can't get through the day. All of our cells would die. And it is especially important to the chronic pain sufferer because it actually takes a lot more energy to heal a damaged tissue than it does to operate a healthy one, right? Most people, especially the chronic pain sufferer, is only creating enough ATP per day to just survive, not to actually heal themselves and to thrive. And contrary to what you might think, it actually takes more energy to relax a muscle than it does to contract one. Now, the less obvious reason why mitochondrial dysfunction is so bad is a dysfunctional mitochondria is the greatest source of endogenous free radicals in your body. So endogenous means being made by your body and free radicals are what we are trying to fight when we take antioxidants. Free radicals are these unstable molecules that kind of bounce around your mitochondria and bounce around your different cells looking for extra electrons. So they bump into good, healthy tissues or they bump into your other you know, damaged tissues that are trying to heal to steal electrons. Well, in the process, they become damaged, but they further damage your tissues or you know, start to damage your good, healthy tissues. And that's a big problem. Any, uh, anything that's good and too much can be bad. And that's exactly what's happening here. All of these hydrogen protons are actually free radicals. So if they don't get pumped through ATP synthase to make ATP, then they're free to roam around your mitochondria, damaging your mitochondria, and then leaving, that, um, leaving the mitochondria to damage the rest of your cell. This is a big problem. So besides free radicals, what are some other things that damage your mitochondria? The first and the biggest are medications. And this is a problem because unfortunately the FDA does not require uh, drug manufacturers to test for mitochondrial damage when they are synthesizing a new drug. This uh, column on the left here, all medications that the chronic pain sufferer are probably familiar with, things like corticosteroids, aspirin, Tylenol, Aleve, and lidocaine for pain all damage your mitochondria. These are drugs that are supposed to be helping us, but in doing so, they end up damaging us even more. And then on the right is other um, medications that you're probably familiar with and may take yourself. Medications for your heart, for anxiety, for depression, antibiotics, cholesterol medications, and diabetes medications. Take a look at this list. If you're taking any of these medications, one, I'm really glad you're here because you really need the mitochondria support now, but you should also be talking to your doctor about this. Now there's some other things like environmental toxins that'll damage your mitochondria. Alcohol reduces ATP production by 12%. It doesn't seem like a lot, but to the chronic pain sufferer who can't spare any ATP, that is really significant. Bisphenols, BPA, and phthalates found in plastics. So if you're drinking out of plastic water bottles, even if it's BPA, it has other bisphenols in it. Um, if you're using plastic Tupperware, all of this is leaching into your water and food and then eventually into you and damaging your mitochondria. Pesticides and herbicides, if you're not eating organic foods, and then food dyes and colorings also damage your mitochondria. But then also lifestyle choices too make a big impact. A sedentary lifestyle is one of the worst things you can do for your mitochondria. Um, exercise, which I don't like that word, I like to use movement. Um, you need it to use up your ATP stores to prevent free radicals from forming. Because if your body's not gonna waste any time or effort doing something it doesn't need to do. So if you're not moving, your body doesn't need to make any extra ATP. And therefore, all of these hydrogen protons back up and become free radicals. And this is why moving after eating is so crucial. Because this NADH and this FADH2, this is your food. So you're fueling the electron transport chain, but you're only fueling free radical production. You're not fueling energy production. 
Um, so yeah, please go for a walk after you eat. It is one of the best things you can do for yourself. And then also low oxygen produces free radicals. Cause remember oxygen is that final electron acceptor. Now, most of us, I mean, all of us were breathing enough to survive and get through the day, but again, not enough to make a meaningful impact on our mitochondrial health. So the more oxygen we can get, the less free radicals that will produce. And this is why breathing techniques and exercises are effective for chronic pain. I know there's been a lot of toolbox talks in the past about different breathing techniques. Um, I don't know if they explain why they're effective, but this is one of those reasons. And then the last thing that you ever wanted to hear is that chronic pain causes mitochondrial damage. Yes, there's this vicious circle of mitochondrial pain or chronic pain causing mitochondrial damage, causing chronic pain, causing mitochondrial damage. And this is through a process called excitotoxicity. See, when you're living in chronic pain, your brain becomes hypersensitive to pain. It's a defense mechanism. Um, and in particular, it becomes sensitive to excitatory neurotransmitters like glutamate. And this increases the amount of energy that you need because you're inappropriately, you know, glutamate is causing uh, your nerves to fire inappropriately and to send pain signals to your brain when it shouldn't be. This all takes energy. So now mitochondria have to work further, but those mitochondria are already damaged. So they're creating more free radicals, which then kill the mitochondria, leaving less to produce energy to actually heal your tissues. Um, side note, think about glutamate. When people get a disc herniation, they always think that it's the physical pressure of the disc pushing on your spinal cord that causes pain. That's rarely the case. See, I can squeeze my arm pretty hard, actually, and I don't feel any pain. Nerves are just used to being stretched and compressed. Really what's happening in a disc herniation bulk of the time is that every disc herniation releases glutamate, which causes aberrant pain signals to go to your brain. So this is a biochemical problem, not a physical problem that surgery can't fix. Um, also, 40% of disc herniations are infected with pathogenic bacteria. So um, that's also an issue that's not being addressed and won't be addressed by antibiotics either. So if you haven't been convinced that uh, you have some sort of mitochondrial dysfunction or that it's associated with every type of chronic pain, common symptoms, migraines, muscle weakness, poor muscle tone, poor balance, muscle cramps, low endurance, chronic fatigue, all associated with mitochondrial dysfunction. If you ask me, it sounds like the chronic pain patient. So I would love to dive deep into how mitochondrial dysfunction is associated with every single chronic pain condition, um, but we just don't have that kind of time. But I think what you've been able to gather so far is that we need energy to heal and we need good, healthy mitochondria so that we're not producing free radicals and therefore more damage. Um, but I do want to give you a couple of examples. The first being fibromyalgia, the condition that everyone says has no known cause and no cure. Um, so let's see what Mayo Clinic has to say. Fibromyalgia is a disorder characterized by widespread musculoskeletal pain accompanied by fatigue, sleep, memory, and mood issues. All kind of sound like mitochondrial dysfunction. Many researchers believe that repeated nerve stimulation causes the brain and spinal cord of people with fibromyalgia to change. This change involves an abnormal increase in levels of certain chemicals in the brain that signal pain. I don't think they could get more vague than that. It sounds like they don't really know what's going on. But luckily, some of us do, because fibromyalgia is a mitochondrial issue. Remember when I said that it takes more energy to relax a muscle than it does to contract one? Well, this is what's happening because all of your blood vessels are lined with muscles. And when you can't relax your blood vessels, they thicken, particularly your capillaries, which are the very ends of your blood vessels um, responsible for transporting oxygen, taking it out of your blood and giving it to the rest of your tissues. But if those capillaries have thickened, that means a lot less oxygen can actually seep through into your tissues, decreasing the amount of oxygen that gets to the mitochondria 
shutting down the electron transport chain. This then drains your pool of ATP energy and in a last, last ditch effort to keep the mitochondria and the cell alive, your mitochondria switch from oxidative phosphorylation, which was that process that I described to you using fatty acids and oxygen to create ATP, and it switches to anaerobic glycolysis, which is the process of using glucose without oxygen. And we've already decided that glucose is energy inefficient and it creates a lot more free radicals but it also creates lactic acid. Lactic acid is that substance that's released when you exercise and it makes your muscles ache and burn. But if you have achy and burning muscles all the time without exercising, as common in fibromyalgia and other chronic pain conditions, this is because you have dysfunctional mitochondria. They're using the wrong fuel source. So how do we fix it? Well, I'll get into that, but absolutely you need D-ribose to help restore your ATP pool. Remember D-ribose was that sugar that creates the backbone, the building block of your ATP. That has to be your first starting place. Um, and then going hand in hand with fibromyalgia and other chronic pain conditions is chronic fatigue. Once again, chronic fatigue is the switch from aerobic respiration via fatty acids, so fat and oxygen to make ATP, to anaerobic respiration using glucose without oxygen. A lot more free radicals, so a lot more cellular damage. And then the production of lactic acid, which is why you're tired and achy. But on top of that, that anaerobic glycolysis uses up all of your glucose. So now there's no glucose left to make D-ribose. So now you can't even make ATP, even if everything else was sufficient. So how do we treat all this? How do we make a healthier mitochondria? Well, unfortunately, there's no drug or surgery that's going to do that for you. We are humans. We require certain nutrients to function and to heal ourselves. And the first we're going to talk about is D-ribose that building block of ATP. And if you can't generate ATP quickly enough, you just run out of it. And if you don't have enough D-ribose, you can't make any more. And the, unfortunately, we just can't seem to get enough D-ribose from our uh, food, and we can't seem to make enough ourselves to actually make a meaningful difference if we're trying to heal from chronic pain. Um, but you should still try to get most of it from your diet. Um, milk, dairy, eggs, and mushrooms are your greatest source of D-ribose. But if you saw my last talk, you know that I completely discourage dairy with chronic pain. Dairy in this country is way too inflammatory, and it's only going to cause more harm than good. So focus more on the eggs and mushrooms, but don't be afraid to supplement because we need three to five grams of this per day to make that meaningful difference. The next nutrient is PQQ, pyroquinoline quinone. Uh, this is a wonderful nutrient because it stimulates the growth of new mitochondria. Amazing. It protects against oxidative damage, those free radicals. Awesome. It's anti-inflammatory. It protects your nerves and it stimulates nerve growth factor to help heal and grow new nerves. You can find PQQ in kiwi, parsley, green tea, tofu, natto, and dark chocolate. Um, the darker, the better, the less sugar, the better. We're not using this as a sweet dessert. We are using this dark chocolate as medicine. Um, and if you can, please avoid trying to get your PQQ primarily from kiwis. Um, fruit is very high in sugar. Sugar is not only inflammatory, but it is sending our mitochondria in the wrong direction. So save fruit as a dessert. Don't be eating it all day long. Um, 20 milligrams of PQQ a day is a good starting place. And now CoQ10, the single most important nutrient for our mitochondrial health. And I'm going to back up a little bit because I realized I didn't explain that well enough. Here's CoQ10. It's shuttling electrons from complex one and two through the rest of the electron transport chain. You can only make as much ATP as you have CoQ10. We call this the rate limiting factor. So if you don't have a lot of CoQ10, you're not going to make a lot of ATP, but you sure are going to make a lot of free radicals. 
Um, we can produce CoQ10 ourselves, but again, it's difficult to make and we make less of it as we age. And there's certain medications like statins and beta blockers that actually completely shut down the pathway in our body to make CoQ10. So if you're taking those two specifically, you need to talk to your doctor. They need to be prescribing CoQ10 as well. Um, also do not take CoQ10 with warfarin. It seems to be the only real interaction. Um, other blood thinners seem to be okay, but always consult with your prescribing doctor. We get CoQ10 from meat and fish because plants don't have uh, mitochondria, so they don't have CoQ10. So this is where we have to get it. Um, and we need about a gram a day to make that meaningful difference. The next is L-carnitine. L-carnitine is so important because fatty acids need a transporter to get into your cells and into your mitochondria. Unlike glucose that can just enter freely whenever it wants to, fatty acids essentially need an Uber to get in. Um, so once they're in, then L-carnitine is so great because it helps remove lactic acid from that cell. So you're really getting a win-win here. It doesn't matter how much fat you eat. If it can't get into your mitochondria, you can't use it. L-carnitine found in meat and fish again, and we're looking to get about a half a gram, 500 milligrams per day. And magnesium, 70 to 80% of people in the US are deficient. And the biggest reason for this is because of water filters and hard water softeners. They remove the magnesium from your water, which historically has been our greatest source of magnesium and other minerals. Magnesium is used in over 300 different things in the body. So that's why we're also deficient. It's going towards your life-saving organs instead of going to healing your tissues. Um, magnesium, fantastic muscle relaxer. And it's also involved in the synthesis and stabilization of ATP. See, ATP actually isn't a stable molecule. It needs to be bound to magnesium in order to be stable, excuse me, and be transported and utilized throughout the body. So we want about 400 milligrams of this per day. Um, and that's like the bare minimum. And I recommend supplementing with magnesium glycinate because of the absorbability. You see, if you walk into your grocery store, GNC, vitamin shop, um, and you reach for that first bottle, I guarantee you it's going to say magnesium oxide on the back on the nutrition label. And that's because magnesium is also unstable. So it reaches up into the air, grabs an oxygen, and now it's stable. Problem is you cannot absorb magnesium oxide. You end up just peeing it out, wasting your time and money. Um, so look for magnesium glycinate just because it is the most absorbable form. Um, but there are other forms that might be beneficial to you as well. And then antioxidants, we got to combat this uh, oxidation problem. Alpha lipoic acid, ALA. Um, I love this one and your mitochondria love it too, because it's fat and water soluble. Your mitochondria is fat and water. Our lipoic acid is the best form. Um, keep it refrigerated because it is a little unstable. You can get ALA from flax seeds, chia seeds, and walnuts, looking for about 100 milligrams a day. And then glutathione. I love this one because it is our body's most abundant antioxidant, um, and it's really good at its job too. You can, we synthesize it ourselves, so you can get all the building blocks from whole foods, um, but supplementing, never a bad idea, 300 milligrams a day. And then just a quick note on supplements. Uh, first off, these doses are just based on various research articles that I've come across. The therapeutic dose that is going to be beneficial for you is going to be based on a few different things. One, how deficient in that nutrient are you? Two, how well can you absorb that nutrient, right? It doesn't matter how much you take if you can't get it into your blood. This is a topic of my last toolbox talk, so go back and watch it. Um, and then also your needs. So what condition are you trying to fight? More conditions are just going to need more support than others. Um, there's a thing about supplements, though. They are a vital component of your treatment plan. Um, but I have a lot of patients that come in and say, I've tried supplements and they don't work. And there's a few factors why. One, 
supplements are just not regulated like prescription medications are. So there's a lot of really bad quality supplements out there with poor absorbability and a very low dose. So if you're not absorbing it, you're not getting the right form of that nutrient, or you're just not you know, getting enough of it in general, it's not going to do anything for you. And you're going to think that supplements are just bogus. Um, the next thing is you need to be careful of where you're buying your supplements from. Um, I'm going to drop a link into the chat at the end of this talk um, on my trusted source. Um, I have an online dispensary that I've uh, made a little category of all my favorite supplements. So you can find all the ones I've been talking about. But we also know that they're the highest quality and from a trusted source because the University of Mississippi did a study where they bought 30 different supplements off of Amazon. And what they found was 17 of those 30 supplements had inaccurate labels. 13 were misbranded and nine had additional components that were detected by their lab equipment, but were not on the label. And it's not like you're getting a freebie here. These are components that are potentially dangerous. Um, I've had plenty of patients in the past who in order to try to save a buck, they first bought the supplement from me, but then went on to Amazon Bought the, bought the product, came in the same bottle with the same label, but when I opened it up, it was clearly counterfeit. It didn't look the same and it didn't work the same when they started taking it. Um, so that's why I'm going to give you this link so that you know you're getting a high quality supplement. And I was also able to partner with them a little bit to give you 10% off. Um, so for mitochondria, the one is through your diet. Um, we want to focus on a high fat diet. Remember, fatty acids produce a lot more energy than sugar does without as many free radicals and without that lactic acid. So cool it on the carbs and sugar. They're inflammatory and they drive your mitochondria into the wrong direction. Then something else I encourage you all to try is caloric restriction. This is the practice of reducing the amount of calories that you eat per day. We humans typically consume way more calories than we need to in a day. Um, as long as you are getting a nutrient dense diet, we don't need anywhere near as many as we think we do. So caloric restriction usually is around 10 to 40% reduction in calories per day. Uh, a lot of studies kind of shoot for that like 30% marker. And there's these two really fascinating studies I'll share with you. Um, they were specific to type two diabetes, but as we've already covered type two diabetes is also a mitochondrial disorder. So this 2007 study uh, reduced the calories in the participants by 25% and then gave them moderate exercise, which was essentially walking uh, for most days of the week. And they do this for four months. After that four months without doing anything else, no supplementation, no other therapies, they saw a 67% increase in mitochondrial density, which is insane. And then a 59% increase in insulin sensitivity, which is fantastic. Now, this 2011 study took things a little bit to the extreme, uh, where they reduced all the type 2 diabetes patients to just 600 calories per day, which you might think is unattainable to live on. That's more than some of our like single meals. But as long as you are getting enough nutrients to supply the rest of your body, we don't need that many calories. Um, and remember that calories just go towards making more free radicals. So this study, 600 calories per day for eight weeks, 100% reversal in type two diabetes, which a lot of doctors will tell you has no cure. Hmm. Um, and then some other lifestyle things you can do to boost your mitochondria. The first being getting movements. The more that you move, the more ATP you need, and therefore the more mitochondria that your cells will make. Now you're going to have more ATP to help heal yourself. And when we're using up our ATP, remember those protons are going towards ATP production instead of free radical production. That is so important. The best way to do this is through high intensity interval training. Now, I'm not going to ask you all to go out and do CrossFit, but what I do want you to do is do something, whatever you can safely to get your heart rate up as high as you safely can, as quickly as you can, and then rest for a couple of minutes to drop your heart rate. And then you go back and forth. 
that's high intensity interval training. And that's what's going to stimulate the most mitochondrial production in your body. And then those breathing exercises. Remember, we need more oxygen than we think we do to stimulate ATP production and discourage free radical production. Now there's two other things, massage and cold exposure that will boost the amount of mitochondria in your body. And it does throw through an interesting way. Um, when we're born, we all have brown adipose tissue. Adipose tissue is your fat cells. And as we grow up, that brown tissue turns into white tissue because babies need a lot more heat and insulation. And brown tissue is full of mitochondria. When you produce a lot of energy, you're also producing a lot of heat. But when we grow, that brown tissue turns white because we learn how to make fires and put on a jacket. We used to think that we lost all the brown tissue and that we couldn't get it back. But it turns out we do keep a little bit of the brown tissue and we can grow more. We can turn white tissue into brown with things like massage and cold exposure. So the popular cold plunges, go and do some of those, um, but just cold showers in general, or in the winter, if it's cold out, just wear a few less layers for like the first 20 minutes you're outside, that'll stimulate more brown adipose tissue, more mitochondria, more energy to heal your chronic pain. Um, and then a study looked at changing or lowering the temperature in your bedroom from 75 degrees at night down to 66 degrees. Now you're making mitochondria while you're sleeping. And then cannabis, um, all of your mitochondria have endocannabinoid receptors on them. So when you ingest CBD and THC, they bind to those receptors, stimulate your mitochondria to make more ATP and less free radicals. And then the last thing, my favorite thing is cold laser therapy. Um, this is my cold laser and one of my patients. Essentially, your mitochondria are also stimulated by certain wavelengths of light, particularly the wavelengths that create red light. Mitochondria stimulated, more ATP, less free radicals. Um, but there is a difference between cold laser therapy and red light therapy. Um, the difference is a physics lesson that we don't have enough time for. But essentially, when you're doing red light therapy with like red LED lights, the wavelength's not strong enough to penetrate your skin, your tissues, and get to your mitochondria. So it's just not effective like a cold laser is. Um, so highly recommend trying to find a practitioner that uses cold laser therapy as one of the best things I have for chronic pain and inflammation. Um, these practitioners are usually going to be chiropractors. You might find a physical therapist also, um, but just a quick Google search should be able to produce one in your area. All right. Thank you. I know we moved really quickly there, um, but I hope you got the gist of it and I'll just leave more time for questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Winkleman. I know you said at the beginning that this might be boring. I did not find it boring at all. I had took so many notes and I'm going to have to go back and rewatch to get more. Um, yeah. It was amazing how much mitochondria affects people that live with chronic pain. And I really liked that you gave so many suggestions that we could try um, to fix our mitochondrial and make our mitochondrial health better. So thank you so much. You're um, welcome. And it's great to have another tool in our toolbox. Um, so we're going to go ahead and stop the recording now and move on to our Q&A.